Good morning, and uh, welcome to the meeting of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, and we are joined here today by Council Members uh, Rory Lansman and uh, Steve Levin. Today we will be holding um, public hearings on four sidewalk cafes, and we'll also be voting on a number of items. Uh, if you are here to testify on any item on the calendar, uh, please fill out a white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the LU number of the item you wish to testify uh, on that slip. It's like this if you haven't uh, done so already. Uh, the first hearing will be on LU 169, the application by Calle Diao uh, Chelsea for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 461 West 23rd Street in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU-169. Okay, uh, Donald uh, Burns Bernstein? Right there. Turn on your microphone. Uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, Press the button. Yeah. Is that working now? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Donald Bernstein, counsel for Calle Dow. With me is Marco Britti, who is the owner of the restaurant. May I proceed? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. Thank you for uh, having this on your agenda this morning. This is an application for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at a restaurant that has been at this location on 23rd Street, the north side of 23rd Street, just about 100 some odd feet uh, east of 10th Avenue. They've been open for about a year. We are applying for a very small sidewalk cafe that consists of four two tops, so there will be a total of eight tables, which is significantly less than the legally permitted number of about 25 seats that could fit in this space. This is, as you well know, a zoning issue. The question of whether or not to approve a sidewalk cafe is not a referendum. Uh, it is not an election. It is determined by law by whether or not there are land use issues and it is in compliance with the zoning resolution. And those issues have been previously determined. Back in 2014-15, the then restaurant was operated as Barchetta, and Barchetta had applied for um, an almost identical sidewalk cafe. They applied for two tables with a total of eight seats. Uh, we are very much aware of the fact that there are residents in the building who do not want a sidewalk cafe. I want to point out that while this is not a referendum, there are many residents in the building who do want the sidewalk cafe. We have submitted to you in the package that I just handed up a number of petitions and letters in support of this sidewalk cafe. The zoning issue was considered back in 2015. Department of Consumer Affairs specifically asked us to get a survey and a title report back then. And I, I say we because I happen to have represented Barchetta at that time. We provided that to DCA, we applied, provided that to city planning, and we were advised back then that it is properly zoned as a split lot for a sidewalk cafe. Though that issue was challenged, it was put to rest, and the, the sidewalk cafe was approved by this committee, by the land use committee, and by the city council. Barchetta operated for about a year, I think, after that, and then they closed. The sidewalk cafe here only um, goes out about seven feet from the side of the restaurant, leaving a avenue-sized sidewalk of 23 feet. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the width of the sidewalk is 23 feet, so it leaves, leaves a clearance of 16 feet well beyond the statutory uh, requirement and limit. A as you're aware, and we dealt with this issue a number of years ago when counsel for the committee confirmed that the only basis for denial can be a land use or zoning issue. It cannot be based upon community opposition. 
and I'm sure you're very well familiar with the, with the um, cases that uh, discuss that point and um, make that very clear. With respect to the propriety of the space as a sidewalk cafe, uh, there are cases that say that classification of a particular use as permitted in a zoning district is equivalent to a legislative finding that the permitted use is in harmony with the general zoning plan and will not adversely affect the neighborhood. Um, that's a matter of law. In addition, the, the scope of this sidewalk cafe is such that it is not going to be a problem. First of all, this is a full service sit down restaurant. It is a Cuban Chinese fusion restaurant. Very unusual, there's nothing like it to my knowledge and based upon what Marco's telling me in New York, uh, it just so happens there was, unbeknownst to me, a very large Chinese population in Cuba in the last century, and many of them came here, and we're offering that cuisine. Uh, as I said, the Sarawak Cafe only will have four tables and eight seats maximum. We will agree to close it at the hours that are requested by Community Board 4, which is 10 p.m. during the week and 11 p.m. on weekends. Um, we had a meeting uh, the speaker was very gracious in, in having his staff meet with us two days ago to discuss this and discuss ways that we can limit its effect on the community. And we came up with a number of uh, ideas about how to do that. We are amenable to doing that. As, as I said, we could have had, uh, by law, perhaps up to 25 seats, and we're not interested in doing that. An important part here is that if you look at Lincoln, uh, uh, London Terrace, the building on the north side of 23rd Street, which st stretches all the way from 9th to 10th Avenue. It's a very large residential building. And it is very difficult to see that there is a restaurant at this location. The facade of the restaurant blends in with the facade of the residential building. There have been at least four restaurants over the years. They have all failed. The space was dark for a very long period of time before Marco took the space. That's not good for a community. It's not good to have a revolving door space where one restaurant comes in, they fail, another one comes in, and they fail. It's important to have this presence on the street. The Sidewalk Cafe goes a long way towards giving that presence to us. So that's why it is important. Additionally, in terms of land use, and I've attached photographs in my uh, submission to you, there is a railing on the ground. It's a flower bed that goes along almost the entire length of this block, block from about 150 feet in from 10th Avenue all the way to about 150 feet from 9th Avenue. It doesn't, it's not in front of the restaurant. So there's a natural alcove right in front of the restaurant where we could put these seats and they will impede no traffic whatsoever. I would also note that uh, I've attached as an appendix to my submission the chart of 311 complaints in the city. I've showed it in this area. There are, in the past year, two 311 complaints uh, on the stretch of, uh, on, the, on 23rd Street in that area. Uh, one of them uh, relates to a party in an apartment, uh, and the other relates to a problem with a tree. Uh, so in the past year, there have been no uh, 311 complaints relating to this restaurant. Um, we think that this would be an amenity to the community. We have support from residents. We have letters from residents uh, who think that this is a good idea. We are in compliance with zoning. We are in compliance with the code. There is no discernible land use issue, and we would uh, request that this be approved just as the Barchetta one was approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You're dismissed. Thank you. Uh, the next panel we have uh, Andy Hum, uh, Harris uh, Schwarty, uh, Anne Northrop, and Mary Ellen Carroll. Sorry, stand up. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Yeah, if you just push the button and state your name for the record, you may begin. Thank you. 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Andy Hum. I'm the secretary of the London Terrace Tenants Association. Uh, we uh, were founded in 1953. We represent 1,000 rental units in the London Terrace Gardens on West 23rd and West 24th, between 9th and 10th. And uh, we strongly urge you to deny this application from Calle Dao for an outdoor cafe. We're joined in opposition by the London Terrace owners, uh, towers owners, whose building uh, where Calle Dao is, and the unanimous opposition of the Building Licenses Permits Committee of the Community Board 4 and the full board itself, unanimously. Uh, when we met with the owner, Marco Br Britti, uh, prior to him getting his liquor license, we knew he had a very checkered record, uh, which is in my, attached to my testimony, of being rejected before, of violating stipulations, so we were nervous about him. Um, but he said, he made a bunch of promises to us, and he put them in writing for the community board, and I have that, and I'm happy to supply his signed uh, stipulations with the community board, where he promised, I will not seek a sidewalk cafe unless I have the support of the Tenants Association, of the Towers, and of the community board. And if I don't get that, I want to be a good neighbor, I'm not going for it. He promised, in writing. He also promised, in writing, in this document, I will not have a storm enclosure outside the restaurant. He put one up anyway. And even if he had the right to do it, um, it would have been illegally large. And it was complained about on 311, so I don't know if they're citing all the 311 complaints. Um, the other thing he promised in writing was, I will not have a bottomless brunch. He's got a bottomless brunch advertised on the weekends every weekend. Promised not to do these things. So in other words, in order to win our support, he made all kinds of promises in writing to a government body. Does that not mean anything? If someone signs something to a government body, are they allowed to just ignore it? If you, if you allow him to go forward and violate his promises, what respect are we supposed to have for government in general if people can just lie in order to get what they want? And by the way, Mr. Bernstein told uh, several misrepresentations when he just testified. He said all the restaurants there were unsuccessful. La Traviata was very successful there, a beloved restaurant. Um, he said that we don't have any Cuban Chinese places in the city. I mean, we, 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 there were some wonderful ones in Chelsea until they were all, you know, moved out by rents uh, for, I mean, 40, 50 years. So uh, that's, that's crazy. Um, uh, uh, well, all right. Let me just go back. Um, I, you know, I, I, the problem, see, we were asked, you know, all right, he wants a sidewalk cafe negotiate with him, try to get him down to certain things. And if we, and if, and we were told, if you don't negotiate with them for, for fewer tables, they can just go to court and they can get these 25 tables and they can stay open until one o'clock in the morning. But the problem is when we negotiate as we did before and we got a promise, they just violate it anyway. So we're not dealing with someone, I mean, and that's his record in previous establishments, agreeing to things and then not doing what he says. So we, we strongly urge you to, uh, to reject this application because, uh, you know, he, he promised not to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mary Ellen Carroll, and I am a shareholder and owner in London Terrace Towers at 465 West 23rd Street at 10th Avenue. I've lived in the building since 1996 and Chelsea since 1992. I'm here to speak on behalf of my fellow shareholders, the board members, and in solidarity with the residents on the block and in the apartments, including Andy and the people that he's representing, but also the people in the neighborhood. Um, I would like to begin by noting that there have been numerous calls made to 311 about the restaurant that has included complaints about loud noise, staying open after hours, groups of people smoking in front of the buildings, garbage, and vomiting. If there's some confusion about this in terms of the record, it may be because the address may have been given at 465 rather than 461. But this needs to be noted. The extracurricular activity of patrons drinking to excess to the point of vomiting is a part of Kalia Dao's history. 
One thing that living atop these establishments provides is a direct view, including the live audio of adults who are not being curbed by their friends. If only they would do the same with their dogs, as evidenced by the photos and the other materials that I'm going to submit via email. It's worthwhile now to quote the city back to itself and the New York City Affairs Guidelines for sidewalk, sidewalk Cafe Design and Regulations. Sidewalks are used by the people to stroll, shop, go from work to and from. Sidewalks of New York were originally designed for four and five story buildings. They now accommodate four story buildings and higher. In fact, sidewalks have become smaller as the demands of motorized vehicles have grown. In crowded streets, pedestrian malls, they're closed to vehicles. Shoppers accept pedestrian congestion and walkers sometimes even enjoy it. But certain vital arteries, such as 23rd Street, have congestion problems that so slow down the life of the city. The High Line now has over 7 million people going up to its uh, entrance at 23rd Street, as estimated by the organization and the architecture firm Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro, who I spoke with this morning. 23rd Street is one of the main arteries for people to get to the High Line and to the West Side Highway and to the parks on the West Side now. And this includes access from the C and the E Line and also the buses and other forms of transportation that people utilize to get there. As stated in the guidelines, on these streets, cafes are not visible options. Sidewalk safety, there's, no need, there's a need to prevent situations that would be uncomfortable and downright dangerous to pedestrians. This need is especially great when sidewalk cafes, which consume large portions of the sidewalks, are imposed upon public thoroughfares already occupied by other obstructions. So we're going to submit some detailed, I'll submit some detailed plans and measurements that actually show what these obstructions are, um, and including photographs of the congestion of the people um, that are actually on the sidewalk. And this is 24 seven. Our concern is for the growing crowding on the sidewalk, the noise, the smells, the trash, attracting vermin, cigarette smoking, all seriously degrading the quality of life and putting at real risk the residents and public as well as the unique character of this historic block between 9th and 10th Avenue. It will have a negative impact on all the residents and buildings and do we have to continue to go through this process with our elected officials when we've already made the case against this on numerous occasions with all of you? In addition, I'm going to also submit drawings that regard the ADA compliance that with Mr. Uh, Bernstein's um, testimony um, would make it impossible within that six foot alcove to have four feet of ADA access that would also include a three-foot area for serving and the ventilation that's required by the building that has the, um, the dryer vents and also the HVAC system that vents directly out onto the street. So another question is, who in their right mind would want to sit at a cafe table with some kind of Febreze or other material blowing onto them while they're enjoying their Cuban Chinese meal. So, in closing, excuse me, I just have to. I just want to thank the committee for hearing this testimony and also that there's going to be consideration um, that the constituents and voters that we implore you to consider all of these statements that we're making and the actual facts that we're going to present to you. This is our city and this is a unique block that provides a much needed repose from the traffic and congestion and that it is the entrance to the High Line and let's keep it this way. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Horace Chowdhury. I'll be, uh, I'm representing Juliana Fry of the London Terrace Towers Co-op Board members, um, and we'll now present her testimony. Dear members of the Land Use Committee, I'm writing today in opposition to the proposed outdoor tables and chairs that the operator of the restaurant Kai Dao is requesting. My understanding of how the previous restaurant owner, Bar Barchetta, got a split lot ruling on their sidewalk tables was by calculating the feet from the 10th Avenue curb to where their basement storage rooms began inside our co-op. Not inside their restaurant, but inside our co-op in the, in the basement. The storage room falls within 100 feet or so of the curb, but it is not in the essence of the law to calculate in basement storage units, which are most likely in violation of city code themselves as they use them as a backup prep area for their kitchen. No ventilation, only mice. Between the eight foot um, by three foot laundry room vent, which is situated in the middle of the proposed outdoor cafe area, and the lack of a proper three foot service aisle or an ADA compliant access to this area, and the approximate eight foot by five foot tree pits, the bike racks, the sandwich boards, and the potted planters. There's simply no room for outdoor tables on this street. Barchetta used to move their tables into the pedestrian sidewalk every day to avoid the air pushed out through the 24 hour laundry room vent. This establishment will definitely have to do the same. You're setting them up for failure if you allow the tables and you are burdening our residents with the job of policing their illegal behavior. It is also discouraging to think that an operator for profit would be considered over the public's needs for more sidewalk space, especially considering we now have over seven million visitors walking this very block to the High Line each year. It is a terrible decision to grant any tables and will only cause much anguish and many complaints from hardworking residents trying to get some rest at home after work. Why the city council would want to grant an operator with a terrible track record permission to continue their bad behavior on our residential block will be inconceivable to our entire community. I would like to point out as well that there is not one outdoor table on 23rd Street from the East River to 10th Avenue. These are all large residential blocks and London Terrace is a sum total of 2,178 apartments located on one full city block. That is, a heck of a lot, that is a heck of a lot of potential complaints from one community. I encourage you to deny the request for any outdoor tables at this location. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ann Northrup and a shareholder owner in London Terrace Towers at 465 West 23rd Street. I've lived there since 1993. Uh, I have to say it kind of breaks my heart to be here. Uh, when Mr. Britty first applied for a restaurant uh, license in our building, we did meet with him. We had a very cordial meeting. We had a meeting of the minds, and we did negotiate uh, a quality of life agreement that worked for all of us. So to have to come here a year later because he has decided that he has changed his mind about that agreement is really heartbreaking and certainly upsetting that we have to keep fighting this uh, month after month, going to community board hearings, this hearing, and any number of other things. Uh, I'm, and I want to uh, echo what Andy said about La Traviata having been a very successful restaurant for at least 10 years in that space. It does not, re they had no outdoor tables, does not require outdoor tables. Le Piff, right next door to Calle Dao has no outdoor tables, nor does any uh, other restaurant, as we've heard, on the whole stretch of 23rd Street have outdoor tables. So I, I really don't think that's going to solve his problem. But I'm interested in what Mr. Bernstein said about the fact that he has a legal right to these tables, barring adverse impact on the community. This will have an adverse impact on the community. Smoking, we haven't talked about. The smoking is all outside the restaurant is already permeating the apartments of people living over the restaurant. And Mary Ellen lives on the second floor right over the restaurant. Uh, and others who have testified at other hearings talk about the impact of that smoke. You cannot fit the tables into that six-foot area, that alcove. Yes, the sidewalk is wide, but those tables must go in that six-foot area, and they will not fit in there with the laundry vent pouring uh, hot air from the laundry 
right into those tables. There is a real quality of life here uh, issue here and a real adverse impact on the community. Uh, it is uh, uh, unimaginable that they would put those tables there. And we have suggested to them that they put an unoccupied table or two out there to advertise the restaurant. They're not willing to do that as a compromise. They want to put out tables that are serving no matter what the community says, uh, no matter what inconvenience it poses to people walking by, and there are large crowds on that sidewalk, and no matter the impact on all the residents living above them who will be impacted by the smoke, the noise, the garbage, the vomiting of drunk patrons, uh, Barchetta violated the agreement about how many hours to be open. Uh, we expect the same will happen here. We are really horrified at the idea of having these outdoor tables. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Are there uh, any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, our next hearing is on LU170, uh, uh, the application by Two Hands Tribeca LLC for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at uh, 251 Church Street in Councilmember Chin's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU170. Uh, uh, seeing that there is no applicant, uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application. Uh, our next hearing is on LU171, the application by Sugary uh, Goddess Corporation, uh, Y <laughs> Oyster Arc uh, Wahiza for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe. Uh, at 4486-4488 uh, Broadway uh, in Council Member Rodriguez's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the hearing on LU-171. Uh, no. no applicants. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, our next hearing is on LU-172. Uh, the application by Sylvia L. Uh, Duran, uh, Grito Me Mexican Grill, for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 1555 St. Nicholas Avenue in Councilmember Rodriguez's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU-172. No applicant being here. Are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application. And now we're going to take a, a short recess, and we'll be back. Thank you.
Mic check, one, two. Everyone, once again, there is no, I know we're on a little break right now, but there is no eating or drinking in the chambers if you do have so. Please just take it out into the rotunda. Sorry for the delay. We'll be starting as soon as the press conference is over. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone that's coming in at this moment, just please find your seat so we could start shortly. There's also additional seating on the balcony if the seats on the main floor are filled up. Once again, everyone that's coming in, if you cannot find a seat on the floor, there are seats on the balcony. We will start shortly. Silence your cell phones at this time. Please don't approach the dais and have a great day.
All right, everybody, we're going to be starting shortly. So I ask you to kindly conclude. Mic check, mic check, one, two. Thank you, everybody, for your singing. We will be starting shortly. I kindly ask everyone that has, can you hear me? Want me to use two mics? Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, that's all I got, sorry. So any uh, posters you have, just keep below your chin. Um, if you disagree with anything, you are allowed to put your thumbs down. Um, if you agree, this is a signal. Food and beverages aren't allowed in the chambers. If you have any, please just take them out into the rotunda kindly. And I appreciate it. Have a great day.
Hey, Richie. Good, man. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your patience. Uh, we are now going to resume uh, the committee meeting. Uh, we will now move on our votes. We will be voting to approve two of the four cafes, which uh, just, uh, we just held a hearing on in accordance with the recommendations uh, of the local members. They are LU-170 and uh, 172. Uh, we will be voting to disapprove LU-169, uh, the application by uh, Galia Dow, uh, Chelsea, uh, given the issues raised in the testimony of the residents uh, of the area uh, that we just heard. Uh, the cafe uh, would be a nuisance to the community based on uh, the testimony. Uh, we will be voting to disapprove LU-171, the application by Waz Oyster Arc. Uh, Wahiza, due to the information in the resolution uh, of the community board about uh, drunk and disorderly conduct of the patrons, demonstrating that the cafe uh, would be a nuisance. We will also be voting to approve LUs 141, the post office, and to file LU 142, nobody's perfect. These two sidewalk cafes were the subject of hearings on July 17th. Uh, the Post Office Cafe has the support of Council Member Reynoso. Uh, Nobody's Perfect uh, Cafe application uh, was withdrawn uh, by a letter dated August 1st, 2018, and will be, uh, and will vote to file it to remove it from the calendar. This morning, uh, we, will, uh, we will be voting on the modifications to an application consisting of uh, six separate land use actions submitted by uh, the Economic Development Corporation that together make up the Inwood rezoning, uh, LUs 135 through 140, 
the Inwood rezoning proposal would rezone 59 blocks of the Inwood neighborhood to require contextual building and a new affordable housing and to promote economic development. Additionally, the proposal would facilitate uh, public access to waterfront, open space, and two major affordable housing developments with a community facility and economic development components on city-owned land. Uh, the Council is modifying the zoning map and the zoning text application in response to concerns voiced by uh, community members and elected officials regarding potential displacement of existing businesses and residents. Uh, the urban design of the new building stock and affordability, affordability levels of new development. The Council is modifying the zoning map amendment LU-135 to, elimin to eliminate the up zoning in most of the commercial U and along Dykeman West of Broadway while retaining the up zoning of the Inwood Library and certain adjacent sites. Additionally, the council is the additionally the council is lowering the proposed uh, density on certain blocks with large concentration of rent regulated housing to reduce the incentive to redevelop these buildings. Even in areas removed from the up zoning, the council is still mapping the proposed C24 commercial overlay and allowing commercial development on the second floor of mixed buildings to promote economic development. The Council is modifying the zoning text amendment LU-136 to remove mandatory inclusionary housing option 2 and to allow deep affordability options. This means that the final version will map MIH option 1 and the deep affordability option, which together require the deepest affordability possible. Additionally, the Council is modifying the application to make the proposed mandatory inclusionary housing areas and transit easement zones match the final upzoned areas. The Council is also establishing new urban design rules to require building base heights in certain areas to substantially match the local neighborhood character, uh, which consists primarily of six-floor walk-up buildings. To facilitate these rules, the Council is creating four sub-areas within Upland Area Subdistrict D, which of these, uh, which each of the, uh, each of which has locally appropriate based uh, height rules. Additionally, the council is uh, retaining the proposed special district in the portion of the commercial U uh, removed from the up zoning via a new subdistrict F in order to promote affordable housing and contextual urban design. The Council's modification would allow developers in this new subdistrict to take advantage of the lower parking requirements proposed for the rest of the special district if they provide at least 20 percent affordable housing at 60 percent of the area median income, which could be achieved with 421A option A and follow the quality housing bulk rules that result in, con in contextual buildings. Additionally, uh, new mixed-use uh, quality housing buildings in the commercial U would be uh, relieved of their parking requirements for commercial and community facilities uses, uh, facility use to promote economic development, which is similar to what is proposed for the rest of the special district. To protect the light and air of existing residents, buildings in the area that use the quality housing bulk rule will be able to take advantage of proposed special rules found elsewhere in the special district that allow new buildings to go 10 feet higher if they uh, set the building back from existing windows that are on or near uh, lot lines. <clears throat> the Council is also uh, retaining the 25-foot limit uh, on bank uh, frontages in the commercial ute to help retain the local retail uh, character of the area while removing the other ground floor controls for scope reasons. The Council's modification would retain the special permit for new hotel construction throughout the entire special district and also allow for gyms and health clubs to be developed as, a right, as of right throughout the special district, even in areas removed from the upzoning. The only other action the Council is modifying is the proposed acquisition of the library, LU-138, while the City Planning Commission approved an acquisition of approximately 18,000 uh, square feet based on the size of the current library. The ELSA development is projected to contain approximately 20,000 feet of, li of library space, and the Council is modifying the application accordingly. 
The community is represented by Council Member Rodriguez, who has engaged with the de Blasio administration and the community for many years to make sure that this process result is the best possible outcome for the community. I would like to invite Council Member Rodriguez uh, to make a few remarks uh, prior uh, to the vote. Thank you, uh, Chairman Moya. And I would like to invite you know, members of our community to get together tonight at uh, one of those restaurants, uh, the one at Aishen, I'm sorry, in Sherman and Broadway, Casa de Mofongo, because I think that it is important for the community to come together. The voices of all of you, as I said, have been heard from my end loud and clear. Like, I'm a community organizer. I'm a guy, I have shared my history. I have not done a rezoning in my nine years, even though I've been invited to engage on big rezoning, Broadway from 155th to 225th, 100 feet side to side. I said, no, this will change our community. I was invited to do a rezoning at Fairview on Broadway. I said no, because it didn't make sense to our community. I was invited to do a rezoning at Nago and Broadway, in the former gas station. I said no. I was invited to engage in conversation for rezoning at Broadway in Sherman. I said no. I feel that a community that, I, as I said before, has been built by Jews that came from Germany, Irish, Italian, Afro-American, Greek. You know, we have some spirit on there as a reminder that that community should be a strong Greek population, then Cubans, then other Latinos. Today we have a big responsibility to respond to a crisis that didn't happen overnight. Our crisis is like the MTA have been the accumulation of decades of elected officials voting for vacancy decontrol, control, of elected officials allowed the Vantes and Pinnacles and others who they were using back tact a lot of tactics to push our people. You know, in nine years that I've been here, I can tell you over and over in the HPD report when the budget session, when I hear, heard, and read all those years, that community were getting Thousand of preservation, two thousand of preservation, two thousand new affordable housing. I always question why Northern Manhattan in the last twenty-five years has received less than one thousand affordable housing built. Why a community didn't get investment on preservation. Very clear. Real estate community wanted to push our people. They stopped providing, allowing people with section eight to get their apartment since 2001 until 2009 when, they, they, when, they, when there was no more Section 8. So listen to all of you loud and clear. I work again with the great chairmen of this zoning committee and Council Member Moya, Council Member Salamanca, Speaker Johnson and his team, Land News, the mayor's side, providing all the information, listening to you. You say loud and clear, this rezoning was too big. This rezoning was too large. And that's why we decide, that's your victory. That's not my victory. That's everything, victory of you, all of you who say, our 7A have to be established in our community so that we protect Sherman, Vermilia, Academy, 204, where from now on, we put a limit and there's not an incentive for anyone to try to build higher in that area. But also we heard that small business have to be protected, that there's a crisis of map and pop store in the city, and that we live in a city that we provide billions of dollars of incentive to the big corporation, but few dollars to the small business. And that's why I'm so proud to say that for the first time in the city of New York, in that rezoning area, when any developers built with city subsidy, we, will, we are establishing a commercial rent control in those sites. Where the map and pop store 
they will get a lease for 10 years. And they will be working in a process to control those increases. I'm happy to say that we have a lot of things. And you will read it. Because for the first time in this administration, in this council, any agreement, there are open data. Anyone will have access to read what were those agreements. But I can tell you among the most important things, big number for preservation, protection, and creation, with a plan to build and preserve 5,100 in the next five years. When we, did get, when we got less than 1,000 in the last 25. We get in DOT site, the one at 205 between 9th Avenue and the river that will be disposal and we will use that site to build 100% affordable. There's a commitment that the sanitation site at 215 between Broadway and 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, we will close that site when the city build all the sanitation sites and that site will be used to build 100% affordable. We're gonna be all working in this plan to work in the Vermilia side. You know, I was told by some people that that side has been heavily used. You, we walk through Vermilia Avenue. How many times, how often do we see children using that site to do a sport? So we want for that site, we have vision for that site to build as a recreational center in the first floor for the school and community use and affordable housing above. That's part of the plan. But also we are building in our city, and in this case we privilege to say that in the tip, in the higher point of the island, the first of the nation, Immigrant Research Center Performance Arts. The research center run by the public library. Therefore, it doesn't matter who the politician is, who the council member is in the future. We guarantee that the future generation will have a site where we will research and celebrate the contribution of all of us together with a big performance art around 250 seat theater for us not to have to go to the Victoria Theater to see a play, but to be able to have those resources in our community. We are investing more than $50 million in the George Washington campus. You heard from the teachers, from the principals, the superintendents, and staff to teach during the winter. Those windows are not working. We're changing all the windows in that campus. We are building, we put in $20 million, $10 million from the council term for the mayor to build, to renovate the two pool with bleaches in area, in an area for students and parents that will be able to use those two pool for the students and the community. We are also getting a PTEC, a nine to 14 school that will be focused on mechatronic STEM education. We got in this process a commitment with resources that our students will be taking algebra in the middle school, but we're gonna be building the pipeline from elementary school so that they are able to make that transition and there's gonna be resources to train and retrain our teachers. We want to make all our school to teach around STEAM education. Female, black, and Latino have been left out in the tech field. Our number are not represented there in Apple, Facebook, and Google, and we need to create a pipeline with that commitment. We are bringing this, the STEAM center that now operate at City College into the George Washington campus to work with the student and the community. So I'm on, I can tell you a lot of things that you will be able to see and with more details, I will be able to celebrate all of you. I think that we as a community,
came through a long process. I'm proud to say that your voices were heard here loud and clear. That probably is not a perfect one, but I feel that downside, the rezoning, taking care of a lot of investments, there's going to be around 500 million investment in capital. Our park will be getting more than 150 million investment in our park and the waterfront, something that we have never seen before. So again, thank you. I want to thank again everyone, you know, from the speaker, Raju, George, James, my staffs, including uh, uh, my chief of staff, Jose Luis, Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, uh, Stephanie Emiliano, Alison James, Evelyn Juan, Van Troy, uh, former DDC Commissioner, Fenioski Peñamora, I know he be left. He's a tenure professor at Columbia, former dean of the School of Engineering. He being one of my top advisors in this process, as also Yvonne Stenet and other members, executive committee of our community. So, le doy la gracia a todo. I want to thank el alcalde de Blasio por lo que ha hecho. Este rezoning le busca respuesta a una crisis que hemos estado acumulando en nuestra comunidad en los últimos 50 años. En los últimos 25 se han construido solamente menos de mil viviendas. En este plan tendríamos 5 mil viviendas construyéndose, preservándose y protegiéndose. En, iniciaríamos o vamos a iniciar el primer modelo en la ciudad de Nueva York de protección de renta a los pequeños negociantes en los lugares donde los inversionistas desarrollen con subsidio de la ciudad. Construiremos el primer centro de celebración, investigación de los inmigrantes con aspecto cultural. Invertiremos en los parques y hoy nosotros muy orgullosamente podemos decir que la voz de toda la comunidad fue escuchada. Que el rezoning que estamos haciendo hoy es diferente a cómo se presentó. Que el rezoning no incluya la parte de Broadway, de Dykeman a la 207. No incluye la 207. No incluye a Dykeman para proteger a los pequeños negociantes. Muchas gracias. Y hoy yo espero de que en la casa del Mofongo, 207 en Sherman, eh, nos juntemos por ahí todas las voces que hemos estado hablando para celebrar un proceso donde tal vez no es perfecto, pero busca mantener el vecindario de Washington Heights como un lugar donde la clase trabajadora vive en dignidad y llevar a la clase media a la clase trabajadora. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Idanis. Uh, we will be voting to approve LUs 144 through 146, uh, the East 14th Street and Irving Place Tech Hub applications for property in Union Square in Manhattan in Council Member Rivera's district, the NYC Economic Development Corporation uh, and 14th at Irving LLC are applicants for a zoning map change, a zoning text amendment, and a special permit. These actions would facilitate the redevelopment of a city-owned site currently occupied by the two-story PC, PC Richard building with a 21-story uh, technology-focused office and retail building in the Union Square neighborhood of Manhattan in Council Member uh, Carlina Rivera's district. I now want to uh, turn it over to Councilwoman Rivera um, for her remarks. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak today in regards to LU 144, 145, and 146. These three land use items would respectively amend the zoning map and grant a special permit to facilitate the development of a digital skills training center on property located at 124 East 14th Street at the former PC Richards site, known colloquially as the Union Square Tech Hub. This building could provide a variety of amenities over 1,400 jobs and provide benefits to our communities from University Place to Avenue D. These are the streets where I grew up and nothing means more to me than finding a balance that preserves, protects, and brings opportunity to every corner of District 2. Before we vote on these land use items, I want to thank the members of this subcommittee, the speaker, the council's land use division, my staff, and all of the community members who spent months and countless hours working with my team as we navigated the Euler process. 
As I vote yes at this subcommittee hearing, I want to make it clear that I am doing this so that I can continue negotiations with the mayor's office towards the possibility of reaching a deal that will satisfy all impacted communities before next week's stated meeting. The mayor's office came to the table with a set of proposals, and I appreciate their commitment to work with us. Over the next few days, I look forward to negotiations and getting to the po point where I and stakeholders are satisfied. The fight to keep history is important, and our vision for the neighborhood includes character and vibrancy for all generations to come. I will continue to involve all the, all the people, all the stakeholders, the people who are in this room who have worked tirelessly for this, including the neighborhood advocates and the organizers during these negotiations. And I appreciate the calls and the letters I have received from so many constituents regarding this decision. I will not stop working until we reach a deal that provides us with a comprehensive, holistic approach to both access to technology education and protections of our vibrant community. Again, I want to thank everyone for the last few months of negotiations. I, I really think that we can come to a place where we find a balance and we can have projects and protections that we are proud of. And again, I want to thank the subcommittee, my team, and of course the speaker and the Land Use Division for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera. Uh, we will be voting to file LUs uh, 166 and uh, 167 and uh, the 40-30 uh, 82nd Street rezoning, which was withdrawn by the uh, applicant on July 16th, will be taken off the calendar. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we will also, we will be voting to modify the East 33rd Street uh, rezoning, LUs 147, 148, applicant uh, 33rd Street Acquisitions LLC seeks a zoning map change uh, from R8A to a C19A and a zoning text amendment to apply MIH option one to the rezoning area, which is in Council uh, Member Rivera's district in Manhattan. Our modification will be to add MIH option two to the zoning text amendment LU148, which applies to a larger area uh, than just the applicant's property. Uh, Councilwoman Rivera, <laughs> you're up one more time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chair Moya, for your graciousness today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in regards to LU-147. LU-147 would allow for an amendment of the zoning map for the property located at 339-345 East 33rd Street that would permit the construction of a new 23-story building that would contain approximately 40 permanently affordable housing units. After continued negotiation regarding this land use item with the developer, 33rd Street Acquisition LLC, I believe we've reached a fair agreement that requires a developer to partner with unions to hire locally, ensures that construction will be completed with as minimal an impact as possible, encourages the applicant to seek a community use for the ground floor retail space, and provides for community involvement throughout the process. In addition, I feel this deal that provides for strong protections and options for existing tenants to return to the completed building regardless of their income level. In the process, based on conversations with HPD, there exists the possibility that this would lead to additional affordable units being created. I want to thank the applicant, the Council's Land Use Division, Community Board 6, and all of the constituents who assisted me during the Euler process. I consider housing to be my top priority. Um, as a council member, and I appreciate everyone's hard work to maximize affordability in a neighborhood that is becoming more and more difficult for the average New Yorker to live in. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make some remarks. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, I now call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve LUs 137, 139, 140, 141, 144, 145, 146, 147, and new cafes that uh, are uh, 170 and 172, and to approve with the modifications I have described on LUs 135, 136, 138, and 148, and to disapprove uh, 169 uh, Calle Dao Cafe and uh, 171 Y Oyster, and to file LUs 142, 146, 
and I'm sorry, uh, 142, 166, and 167. Uh, council, please uh, call the roll. All items are coupled. Chair Moya? Aye. Constantinides? With reservations, I vote aye. Lansman? Aye. Levin? I vote aye. Reynoso? I vote aye. Richards? Aye. Rivera? Aye. Torres? I vote aye, but I'm going to abstain on the inward rezoning. All items are approved by a vote of eight in the affirmative, zero negatives, and no abstentions except for land use items 135 through 140, which are approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, no negatives, and one abstention. And all items are referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, before we conclude uh, this subcommittee meeting, I, I would just like to read um, a statement uh, that I have prepared. Uh, as I've said previously before uh, this subcommittee, and I will continue to say is that I believe that housing is a human right. Uh, it's our duty as legislators and uh, the government's obligation to ensure that safe, secure, and affordable housing is available to those who need it. New York City is in the grip of a housing crisis, and we're going through it. We first need to understand it, and here's the truth. This housing emergency only affects low-income households. There is no housing crisis for market rate renters. What we need are more affordable units, not luxury and market rate apartments. To continue building market rate units is to treat a problem that doesn't exist, while at the same time ignoring the critical threat that's affecting countless working class New Yorkers. As a city, we have yet to find and implement a solution to this housing emergency. But it's clear that that solution will include rezonings. We must take a mindful approach to each rezoning so we don't doom the communities that we're trying to aid. That means ensuring rezoning developments include responsible contractor language and that the men and women tasked with building these projects are paid a living wage and work under safe conditions. It means that we need to study neighborhoods before and after they're rezoned to get a holistic understanding of their effects, specifically of secondary displacement. And it means expanding the certificate of no harassment to protect residents from predatory landlords. Additionally, the city must make higher NYC data available to the New York City Council and the public so that we have a substantive, conversa a substantive conversation about this initiative and how effective it is at promoting local hiring. It's no secret I also have a fundamental misgivings about the city's strategies to create affordable housing, specifically the mandatory inclusionary housing program. I believe we need to change the conversation and stop relying on the market to save us. We are in the midst of a housing crisis. If you haven't noticed, perhaps it's because you're not spending 40, 50, 70 percent of your income on housing like many working class New Yorkers are. The housing emergency is real and the market isn't coming to rescue us. It's time to create affordable housing because it's the moral and human thing to do, not because private developers can turn a profit. But lastly, I want to speak directly to everyone in the audience here today and those that are watching uh, on the live stream, is I want to apologize for the protracted delay that we had in this hearing and thank you for your patience. You should not have to sit here waiting while these last minute negotiations drag on. It's shameful that the mayor's office drags negotiations out to the 11th hour down to the last second. There are thousands of lives dependent on a responsive and responsible government and subjecting their fates to this uh, treatment is an insult to all New Yorkers. Having said that, uh, there have been some truly amazing people uh, who have worked on this uh, tireless effort to get this rezoning done and that is the staff in land use. And I really want to take this opportunity to thank George Zakarian, uh, James Lloyd, uh, my co-pilot here, uh, Julie Lubin, uh, Raju Mann, and Amy Leviton. Uh, these folks spend countless hours and probably didn't go to sleep till about four o'clock this morning uh, to make sure that they can bring uh, the best possible project uh, forward. Uh, so I really want to take my hats off to the land use staff and thank them for everything that they've done. Uh, this concludes today's hearing, 
and, and I would like to thank the public, my colleagues, uh, council, and of course the land use staff for attendance. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>